It's 3 a.m. and your patient needs an awake intubation. What's your plan to anesthetize the airway? There are a lot of choices out there, but if you need the job done well and rapidly, you need to consider nerve blocks of the airway. And in this video, we'll take you through a simple step-by-step -step method to get complete airway anesthesia in less than five minutes. It's super satisfying to pass the tube into the trachea with a patient wide awake and completely numb. And at the end of this video, we'll show you an example of just that. But I've seen my share of awake airways that were a painful struggle with gagging, coughing, and multiple failed attempts. Why is it so hard sometimes? Well, for starters, the airway is richly innervated and inherently hard to anesthetize. You also need to block at least six nerves to get complete airway anesthesia, which can be technically challenging. And finally, putting local anesthetics directly on the airway mucosa sounds good, but it's often flawed in practice, especially when the patient has secretions that block the absorption. The airway is innervated by three principal nerves. The aptly named glossopharyngeal nerve innervates the tongue, or glossus, and the pharyngeal walls. It also takes care of the posterior third of the tongue, the vollecula, and the anterior surface of the epiglottis. This is the nerve responsible for the gag reflex, which can make or break your awake intubation. Remember this? Yeah, that's our friend glossopharyngeal. The superior laryngeal nerve is a branch of the vagus and innervates the inlet to the larynx, which includes the posterior surface of the epiglottis, the area epiglottic folds, and the upper surface of the cords themselves. The nerve runs along the thyrohyoid membrane and then divides. The internal branch punctures the membrane to innervate the airway, while the external branch continues on as a motor branch to the cricothyroid muscle. And then we have the recurrent laryngeal nerve, another vagus branch, that innervates the airway at and below the cords. The palate is innervated by the maxillary branch of the trigeminal, but it's not all that clinically relevant for our purposes. Note that the cords themselves are co-innervated by both the superior and recurrent laryngeal nerves. Okay, that's the anatomy. Now, how do we block it? If we took a poll, we'd probably find dozens of technique combinations. Do we use an atomizer or should I make the patient gargle with viscous lidocaine? I find a lot of trainees get confused with a surplus of choices. Now, what if I told you there was one way that was reliable, safe, and super slick that you could use in 96% of awake airways? And I know, some might stop me here and say, well, why not just crank up some Remy and Dex and Midazolam and give just a little bit of propofol and we can overcome those pesky airway reflexes. Well, sedation can be a useful adjunct, but there are two drawbacks. First, patient cooperation is critical for these procedures, and more importantly, if you over-sedate, you turn a potentially bad airway into an emergent and actual bad airway. The secret to awake intubation is complete airway anesthesia. Let the local anesthetic do the work. So, back to our three sets of nerves. For each of these, I'm going to suggest a plan A block that gets the job done for you when it counts. To do all three, you'll need the following, a 22 gauge spinal needle, four 3 mil syringes, one 10 mil syringe, 25 or 23 gauge needles, 20 mils of 2% lidocaine, a tongue depressor, a syringe for skin local, and prep gauze and gloves. We'll do the glossopharyngeal nerve first. The glossopharyngeal, okay, I'm just going to call it the GP nerve from now on, gives three main branches, but importantly runs submucosally by the tonsillar pillars. We're going to take three mils of 2% lidocaine and administer that submucosally using a 22 gauge spinal needle. To get there, you need to retract the tongue to the side. This can be done with a tongue depressor, or you can use a laryngoscope with a MAC3 blade, which has the added advantage of shining a light right on the target. As you retract the tongue, you'll see the anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars, with the palatine tonsil in between. Anatomically, the ideal place to inject the local is the caudal aspect of the posterior tonsillar pillar, where it meets the floor of the mouth, simply because that's where it's closest to the GP nerve. But studies and clinical experience have shown that putting the local at the base of the anterior pillar is just as effective in most patients, and doesn't require as much mouth opening. Okay, let's see this done. Get a view of the anterior tonsillar pillar. Advance the needle through the mucosa about one centimeter, aspirate, and inject all three mils. That's it. Then come out and do the other side. Pretty quick, pretty easy, and pretty well tolerated. Now, let's test this GP block. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just what I thought. If you aspirate blood, you're probably too far lateral and in fact might be in the carotid. Don't inject unless you want to make your airway really exciting. Pull back and aim more medial. If you aspirate air, you've gone through and through and are now in the pharynx behind the tongue. Withdraw and don't be quite so aggressive, Zorro. Next, we'll move on to the superior laryngeal nerve block. 
We're going to use a linear ultrasound probe to image the thyrohyoid membrane between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage. Place the probe in the sagittal orientation just off the midline. Here we see the bright hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage and can appreciate the membrane stretching between them. The tissue just deep to that is the pre-epiglottic space. You can't see the nerve in most cases, but if we put the local anesthetic just deep to the membrane, you'll block it. Here we see the needle inserted out of plane from the medial side. We'll often use small puffs of saline or local to locate our needle tip. Once your tip is through the membrane, you'll usually feel a pop. Aspirate and inject your 3 mils of local. You'll see the pre-epiglottic space fill up with local, which guarantees a great block of the superior laryngeal nerve. This technique is safe and there's not a lot of ways to go wrong. The superior thyroid artery is always in the vicinity, so just take care to identify and avoid it and aspirate prior to injection. There's a landmark-based technique where you palpate the greater cornua of the hyoid bone and then hit that bone with your needle. I don't know about you, but I'm not really stoked about my cornua palpation skills in a neck like this. Like pair vertebrals, this is a high-stakes real estate area. You have the ability to make it an image-guided block, why wouldn't you? After the first injection, we'll do the other side. And finally, we get to the recurrent laryngeal nerve to cover the cords and the trachea. The simplest way to approach this is via a transtracheal technique. A convenient location to access the proximal trachea is the cricothyroid membrane between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages. The technique involves advancing a needle through that membrane into the airway and injecting the local anesthetic. This usually provokes coughing, and that action distributes the local in the trachea and to the underside of the cords, anesthetizing those structures. Some people like to use a small angiocath, here we see a 22 gauge, attached to a syringe partially filled with saline. After identifying the cricothyroid membrane and prepping the skin, the operator advances the needle directly back with no angulation. There's often a surprising amount of soft tissue to get through in some patients. When you feel a give, aspirate, and the presence of air bubbles returning confirms the needle tip placement within the trachea. Excellent. Now, stabilize the cannula and withdraw the needle. Attach your syringe containing 4 mils of 2% lidocaine, aspirate one last time, and inject fairly quickly. We can see the jet of local splashing around inside the trachea. The other technique is just to use a needle with no cannula. Again, inserting directly backward, the needle enters the airway with a small give. The operator stabilizes, aspirates air, and then injects quickly. I find this easier and faster than the cannula method, which involves an extra step and sometimes gets kinked. Some get worried about the sharp needle in the airway backwalling the trachea, which is possible, especially when the patient starts coughing. However, the trachea's diameter is larger than we often think, and with good stabilization, you minimize that risk. Now, how do we find the cricothyroid membrane? You could palpate, of course, which might be easy, but then again, wait, we have ultrasound, right? Cool. Airway poke is to the rescue. Place a linear probe on the anterior neck below the Adam's apple and orient it in the sagittal plane. You may need to be slightly off center to get the best image. What you'll see is this. These small dark ovals are the tracheal rings and look like pearls on a string. The bright wavy line underneath is the airway mucosal interface of the anterior trachea. Scan cranially until you see a much larger pearl that is oval and more superficial. This is the cricoid cartilage. Then continue cranially to find the hyperechoic thyroid cartilage. The cricothyroid membrane stretches between these two cartilaginous structures. Note that the bright white line is not the membrane, that's still the airway mucosal interface. A handy method to mark this on the skin accurately is to take a blunt needle and slide it between the probe and the skin, centering it over the membrane on the ultrasound screen. Then remove the probe and put a mark where the needle is. It's helpful to anesthetize the skin first before starting. You'll want to drop 4 mils of lidocaine in a 10 mil syringe, so there's plenty of room to aspirate the air back. Here it is one more time. Insert, pop, aspirate, and inject. At the end of the injection, the patient starts to cough, which is normal and desirable to spread the local. And that takes care of all three sets of nerves. Tongue retraction during the glossopharyngeal nerve block can sometimes provoke a gag in some sensitive patients. When this happens, I'll spray a small amount of additional lidocaine directed toward the posterior tonsillar pillar, let it sit for a minute, and then retry. What about nasal fiber optic intubations? Don't sweat it. Usually you can skip anesthetizing the nasal cavity and the nasopharynx. Remember, patients get NG tubes all the time and they only gag when the tube hits the back of the tongue. Is this technique good for every awake airway? No, of course not. 
The glossopharyngeal block is difficult if mouth opening is limited, and there may be infection or tumor that precludes putting a needle in the neck, but I find for the majority, this is my plan A. Lots of people use nebulizers, gargling, spray and pray, or other topical methods, but these all take precious time. That's fine if it's a difficult airway for an elective operative case, but not good if your patient has respiratory distress. These methods are also frequently ineffective because of secretions, blood, or tumor preventing the local from getting to the right spot. We have plenty of data showing that patients just do better with blocks than topicalization. In contrast, this technique is well tolerated, and even in a wide awake patient with no skin local, it's not uncomfortable. It's also a safe dose of lidocaine. We continue to hear about cases of last during airway topicalization, some of them fatal. When you're using 4 or 10% lidocaine, things add up very fast in this very vascular tissue. This technique uses 320 milligrams, which unless you're under 60 kilograms, is within the safe limit of 5 mg per kg. And maybe most importantly, these are quick to do. The whole set is done in less than 5 minutes, and by done I mean ready to put a tube in awake. Speaking of which, let's see how our um, patient did with these blocks. And there's proof that these simple blocks are frequently all you need for super slick, easy, awake airways.